Now turn with me in your Bible to the book of Isaiah. We're in Isaiah chapter 1. Isaiah chapter 1. And I'm going to read from verse 10. Isaiah chapter 1 verse 10. Isaiah, remember, is the book that's likened under the Bible itself. It's got 66 chapters divided into two sections. One is a 39 portion and the other has 27, a bit like our Old and New Testament. Uh, that's why the book of Isaiah, young people, is called the Bible in miniature. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 10. Hear the word of the Lord, ye rulers of Sodom. Give ear unto the law of our God, ye people of Gomorrah. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me? saith the Lord. I am full of the burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts, and I delight not in the blood of bullocks or of lambs or of he goats. When ye come to appear before me, who hath required this at your hand to tread my court? Bring no more vain oblations. Incense is an abomination unto me. The new moons and Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies, I cannot away with. It is iniquity, even the solemn meeting. Your new moons and your appointed feasts, my soul hateth. They are a trouble unto me. I am weary to bear them. And when you spread forth your hands, I will hide mine eyes from you. Yea, when you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Wash you. Make you clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do well. Seek judgment. Relieve the oppressed. Judge the fatherless. Plead for the widow. Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If ye be willing and obedient, ye shall eat the good of the land. But if ye refuse and rebel, ye shall be devoured with the sword. For the mouth of the Lord have spoken it. Amen. We know God will stamp with his own approval and blessing this reading of the Holy Scriptures. Now my text tonight, if you haven't already guessed, is Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18. And my subject this evening is God's amazing offer to sinners. The prophet Isaiah has been called the evangelical prophet. He lived and prophesied 700 years before Jesus Christ came into the world. In his day and generation, he declared the message of God, saving grace. And amazing love for sinners for over 40 years. And here's one of his key verses. One of many out of the 66 chapters that makes up the book of Isaiah. This verse, Isaiah 118, I believe is a wonderful gem. A a spiritual dazzling diamond among the, the diamonds of scripture. See, God is speaking here. He's addressing sinful men. He's issuing what I'm going to call an invitational 
ultimatum to the ungodly. Here he comes and he's taken the initiative and he makes an amazing offer to be the redeemer of all who will trust him as Lord and Saviour. He's making an amazing offer to pardon sins of the deepest dye that we have been singing about. Pardon, of course, that would be bestowed through Jesus' precious blood. We can say tonight from the pulpit that God loves sinners. You see, God, from all eternity, in grace has worked and laboured for the salvation of all who would put their faith and trust in Christ as Redeemer. It's coming near the end of January, isn't it? And the January seals are already in uh, full flight. And of course, there's still loads of amazing offers in the shop. They haven't been shopping. Uh, but of course, there's adverts on the television. Uh, Amazon, I'm told, has got some amazing deals on offer at the moment. And I'm certainly not advertising that you go and spend your money hard earned. But I was thinking, amazing offers in the shops or on the television or, or in the newspaper. But here's one of the greatest. Here's one of the best offers. One that stands head and shoulders above the rest. God's amazing offer to sinners. Now I'm using the same outline, young people, that I gave you a few weeks ago in the Bible class. I want you to think of the fact of God's invitation. It says, Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. You see, understand tonight, this is a God-given invitation. God is speaking. God is addressing sinful men. He's literally addressing the people of Jerusalem and the uh, territory of Judah. You see, sadly, the tribe of Judah have become a very sinful people. Jerusalem itself has become a very, very sinful place. And here's the Lord, and he comes in sovereign grace. He comes in mercy. He, he, he comes in goodness to where the people are spiritually, living in their sin. And he speaks to them about an amazing offer. Now make no mistake, these people are sinful and rebellious. They deserve wrath and they deserve judgment on account of their sin. But the Lord comes in mercy, he comes in grace, and he issues this invitational ultimatum. Now, now imagine you getting a, a, an invite or a summons to the queen. What would you do? I guarantee all of us here, youngest to the oldest, we would be excited and we'd be telling others, Her Majesty the Queen has summons me to come at such and such a time and appear before her. Or even the Prime Minister. But it's neither the Queen nor the Prime Minister. It's not the monarch of the land. It's God in heaven. The Lord of glory. This is also a gracious invitation. Think of the word come. Come. That, that's an invitational word. You're familiar with it. In fact, it's used 642 times in the Bible. And in the vast majority of cases, it's God who gives out this invitational ultimatum. Therefore, it's not only God given, but it's a very gracious thing for God to say to sinful men to come. This is come as rooted in the grace of God. It ties into Genesis 7 and 1 where God said to Noah, uh, Come thou and thy family into the ark. Uh, this is the same um, God uh, of whom it is written in the last book of the Bible, in the book of Revelation, chapter 22, and in the verse um, uh, 17, And the Spirit and the bride say, Come, and let him that heareth say, Come, and let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. Here's God in grace given you an invitational ultimatum. And as I've suggested, as I've set forth, remember 
God is in heaven. And God is intrinsically thrice holy. He's the one of whom Isaiah saw in chapter 6. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, which is, which was, which is to come. So, so this is a very genuine invitational ultimatum. It comes from God, but it's rooted in God's grace. So it's not only God given, but it's gracious. And I want to tell you something else. This is a great invitation. You see, this is not just an invite. This is actually in the form of a command. Remember what I said, it's an invitational ultimatum. Because this is really a summons from God. You see, we get the picture today in our mind when we hear the word come. You hear the words come to Jesus. You say, well, but I'm not interested. No thanks. We have heard that in the doors that they consider Christ outreach. Please keep the invite. It's not relevant to me. You see, it's regarded as something that's very weak. It's like inviting people to a birthday party or inviting people to a wedding reception. But that's not the picture, young people. Men and women, there's great power lies behind this invitational ultimatum. Because it's a message from God. The Lord is King of Kings. He is Lord of Lords. This is not a mere suggestion. This is not a take it or leave it if it suits you. If the notion comes on you and dawns in your mind. This is a command, a summons, an ultimatum. See the picture is of a judge seated at the bar. The individual's in the dock. He's guilty as charged. The the defendant is worthy of a very stiff sentence. He's legally guilty. He can put up no defence against the charge. Sinner by nature and practice. The, The hammer, of course, deserves to fall. But this judge is merciful. He is just but the justifier of the ungodly. And he gives the sinner an opportunity. He offers the sinner a way where he can experience mercy. He's saying to the defendants here at the bar of justice, you plead now for mercy. Come and admit your sin. Put your hands up and say, judge him guilty. Have mercy on me. Isn't that what the publican prayed? Luke 18 in the temple. One man stood and boasted how great and good he was. The things he'd done. The money he'd given away. The other man smote in his breast and said, God, be merciful to me the sinner. You see, the sad reality is that men and women who hear the gospel tonight so often trifle with God's invitational ultimatum. It's not just an invitation that you can take or leave. It's not like an invite to a birthday party or a wedding reception. This is a summons from God. God is speaking. And maybe I could just add this. Do you see, if the Queen was to summons us to come, with all the authority of the House of Windsor behind it, We would be foolish not to appear. But this is not the queen of the realm. This is the Lord of glory. Don't put this invitational ultimatum in the back burner. Don't think about tomorrow. Boast not thyself of tomorrow. For no man knoweth what a day may bring forth. The Bible says sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Don't think to yourself when I have a more convenient season. I'll think about it. The Bible says, Behold, now is except the time. Now is the day of salvation. <laughs> Hebrews 3 and 7, Today if you'll hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. The fact of God's invitational ultimatum. Now I want you to think of the character of the people to whom this invitational ultimatum was given. See, you'll find a description of the people in chapter 1, verses 2 to 6. Let's just read that together. 
I could quote it, or at least attempt to. Learned it years ago in the faith mission. But my mind's not just as sharp as what it was, so we'll just read it together. You, you follow in the book. Look at verse 2. Hear, O heavens, give ear, O earth, for the Lord hath spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. The ox knoweth his owner, and the ass his master's crib, but Israel doth not know. My people doth not consider, ah, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors, they've forsaken the Lord, they've provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger, they're gone away backward. Why should you be stricken any more? Ye will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick, and the whole heart faint. From the sole of the foot, even unto the head, there's no soundness in it, but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores, they have not been cl closed, neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment. What a terrible picture. And when you think of this state and condition of the people as God describes it, doesn't this terrible picture, this black cloth, magnify the grace and goodness of God? Doesn't it magnify how great a God he is in his love and his compassion? People who were sinful, rebellious and loveless. But the Lord comes in grace and mercy with this invitational ultimatum. Have you realised tonight how sinful you are in God's sight? Can you put your hands up and say, Lord, I am sinful. Lord, show me how sinful I am. Lord, thank you for being gracious and good to me. Lord, thank you for loving me in Jesus' name. Thank you for commending your love toward us. And while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Lord, Lord, I thank you for who you are. See, there's the fact of God's invitational ultimatum. Very quickly, think of the focus of God's invitational ultimatum. Look at verse 18 again. It says, Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. You see, this summons is to come and sit, as it were, at God's conference table. We're to come to God and present our reasons for our sinfulness, our rebellion, our rejection of him, our turning away from him. There's an appeal here to the intellect. Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Now, I want you to understand that this is not a conference of two equals around a table. It's not the individual sinner thinking, well, I'll just give the Lord a piece of my mind. And I'll tell the Lord what I think of him. And I'll tell him that I don't believe in him. And this, this saved business, well, it's a load of nonsense. You've got to remember that one at the table is the sovereign Lord of the whole universe. The Lord of glory, King of kings and Lord of lords. He's one in the throne, the only true and living God. The, 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 the only true king and potentate of heaven and earth. The high and lofty one. One who is thrice holy. One who has eyes as flames of fire, hair as white as snow. One seated on the right hand of the throne of God. And he's saying to you, the sinner, you give me your reasons for not coming to me. Now, isn't that an amazing thing? Isn't it amazing that we have reasons at all and excuses for not coming to him and repenting of our sin and receiving him to be our Lord and Saviour? What reasons could we have? What excuses could we have? Let me just suggest some. I'm too bad to come. How many times have we heard that? The Lord wouldn't want anything to do with me. I'm just too sinful. I think of all the uh, iniquities that I've committed. Well, listen to the Bible. Let the word of God speak to your heart. In Isaiah 55 and verse 7 we read, Let the wicked forsake his ways, and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return unto the Lord. And he will have mercy upon them, and to our God, for he 
will abundantly pardon. He is the great God of wonders. And as we were singing, who is a pardoning God like thee, or who is grace so rich and free? Isn't it written in 1 John 1 and 7, the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanseth us from all sin. So that excuse is answered. Maybe you're thinking, but I've got too many problems to come. Life is so hard and difficult. See, many people are full of burdens. Many people say, but I have little time to think about the Lord. I'm so busy. I'm a housewife. I I, I work this job. I work a second job. I've got children to look after. I've got a home to look after. And I have too much pressure and too many problems. Having time to think about the Lord. Do you know what he says? Come unto me. All ye that labour and are heavy laden. And I will give you rest. He's interested in those that are hurting. He's interested in those that have got problems and pressures of life. And he's still saying, come unto me. With your heavy burden, you'll find rest in me for your soul. What about the individual who says they've got plenty of time? Talk about tomorrow, next week, next year. But the Bible talks about today. The only certainty of life is its uncertainty. I said this morning, look how speedily Ernie slipped into the presence of the Lord. He was well last week. He was in great form. He's reciting the Lord's Prayer on the Thursday, quoting scripture. Then the Monday morning, he just slept away in Jesus. Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for no man knoweth what a day may bring forth. And we can talk about the many deaths that we've been thinking about, whether it's the death of the young girl down there in Castle Wellen, or, or the wee boy in Clock Mills with a chest of drawers falling upon him, or the wee boy in Newton Ards uh, running out uh, 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 to, to get his mummy uh, and, and being knocked down by a car and ushered into God's eternity. You see, see how quickly life can change. You see, young people, how fragile it is. That's why the Bible says, behold, now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. Maybe you're here, and here's another excuse that we often come across. Well, I'm doing the best. Well, what more can I do? Well, your best is not good enough. Your best is not accepted by God. Cain brought the best that he had, an offering of fruit and veg. Lovely stuff, I'm sure. It would probably be akin to our organic stuff and maybe even ten times better. But God wouldn't accept it. you know why? Because God demanded a blood sacrifice. That's what Abel brought. And Abel was accepted and counted as righteous on that basis. The Bible says, For by grace you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. To those that say, I'm doing my best, that's an excuse for not coming. The Lord says, but your best is not good enough. Because your best is... Like, your righteousness is filthy rags in my sight. Maybe you're also thinking, well, I'm turning over a new leaf. I'll become a reformed character. I'll give up the booze and the fags. And I'll get a new suit and get my hair cut. I remember a man in Coleraine that done this. I remember him well. His name was Love. And he used to sing after he really got converted, Love lifted me. But for a long time, he was just in the church singing the hymns. He, he was acting the Christ, like the Christian. He was talking like a Christian. But in reality, he wasn't a Christian. Because he wasn't born of the Holy Spirit. He'd never come to the place where he acknowledged his sin and trusted Christ. Here's another reason. Well, I've got my church. And how many people in Northern Ireland tonight are depending on the church? Whether it's the Church of Ireland, the Presbyterian, the Methodist. Doesn't matter. Even in the Free Presbyterian Church. Do not depend on the church. Don't say, well, I've got my faith and I've got my religion. Because the Bible has an answer. Jesus saith, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. Salvation is not in the church. It's in Christ and in Christ alone. And, and we, we, we long that our Protestant people, we long that Roman Catholics alike would come to understand that. 
that salvation is not in the church. And there's many sincere people in our community, religious people, and they have a certain religiosity and respectability about them. But the reality is they're not trusting in Christ. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there's no other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. And here's God. And he appeals to the sinful man to sit at his conference table. And the Lord's saying, bring up all your reasons, boy. Monger, I want to hear them. I've got an answer for every one of them. I am holy and you're sinful. And if you bring a reason, I'll give you an answer. See, the Christian faith is a reasonable faith. It makes sense. It, it appeals to the intellect. And the Lord is saying, switch on your mind. Engage with me. Think. Think in these things. that I, All these excuses, which, which are like a refuge of lies that you hide in. The Lord wants you to think about them. Here's the focus of this invitational ultimatum. And notice lastly, the fruit of God's invitational ultimatum. There's a great truth here. Look at the text. These are tremendous words. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as well. Sins that are scarlet sins. Sins that are crimson sins. This is a reference to the city of Jerusalem. 700 years before Christ. This is a reference to the territory of Judah. What was, what was life like in those days, in that city, in that land? Well, there was adultery. There was murder. There was theft. There was bribery. There was lies. There was jealousy. There was unfaithfulness. Listen to these words. How has the faithful city become an harlot? It was full of judgment, righteousness lodged in it. But now, murderers. Thy silver has become dross, thy wine mixed with water. Thy princes are rebellious and companion of thieves. Every one loveth gifts and followeth after rewards. They judge not the fatherless, neither doth the cause of the widow come unto them. Therefore saith the Lord, the Lord of hosts. God is speaking. And you know, before we stand and say, well, tut, tut, isn't that dreadful about what's happening in the city of Jerusalem in the land of Judah? Let's think about our own city of Belfast. Let's think about our own land at this minute. Because we're, we're just as bad. Adultery, murder, theft, bribery, lies, covetousness, hypocrisy. See, that's what sin is. Sin's a transgression of the law of God. It's any one of conformity unto it. And yet here's the heart of God's offer. Sin's as bad. Sin's like scarlet. Sims of crimson, deep as dye. And God is offering a full, free, forever pardon of sins. See the reference to scarlet and crimson sins indicate glaring sins. Sins that stand out. They're open, naked to the sight. Scarlet is a very fast <coughs> colour. It's double dyed. It's dipped twice to make it a fast colour. And you see, that's how their sins appeared in God's sight. And that's how our sins appear in God's sight. They're just like scarlet, they're crimson sins, even the smallest of sins. And yet what does he offer? A full, free, forever forgiveness for the worst of sinners. See, there's no one too bad to come. Think of the greatest sinner on earth. Who would that be, I wonder? Do you ever think of that? Who was the chiefest of sinners? 1 Timothy 1.15 This is a faithful saying Worthy of all acceptation That Christ Jesus come into the world to save sinners Paul adds Of whom I am chief And if there's salvation for Paul And he got a full and free and forever pardon then there's none too bad. It can't come. This invitation means that even the one who lives a, a protected kind of life and hasn't fallen into these gloats and glaring sins of the flesh, 
they can come. Because if the worst can come, the invitational ultimatum applies to those who are religious and have lived a sheltered kind of life. Because the Bible says, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. I met a man yesterday. Sammy Wade was with me. We spoke a little minute to him and he told us that he wasn't a Christian. He said he would like to become a Christian. We told him how he could become a Christian. We didn't force him. But that was the emphasis. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord, Dennis, shall be saved. This invitation is to all kinds of sinners. Look unto me and be ye saved, all ye ends of the earth. There's a great truth here. Quickly in finishing, there's a great transformation. Think of the words, white as snow. Be like wool. Scarlet, crimson sins. White as snow. Made like wool in the sight of God. You see, that's a great transformation. How is it possible? The shed blood of Christ. That brings us to the work of the cross 2,000 years ago. Christ the substitute for us. Christ the surety paid the price that we owed to the broken law. Christ the sin bearer. He bore our sins in his own body in the tree. <coughs> wounded for our transgressions. Bruised for our iniquities. Christ the sin offering. The wrath of God fell in him. Christ the sacrifice. The Lamb of God. <coughs> all to become our saviour. What an amazing offer tonight. Here's how it's possible. Your sins. You can get a full, free and forever pardon. What an amazing offer. And I just want to finish. Have you accepted this offer tonight? Young people, man, woman, boy or girl. Have you come to Christ? Don't come to the preacher. You can ask me for help and I, I would be glad. I'd be thrilled. But it's Christ that saves. Jesus saves. We believe that. You can go directly to him. You can cry out like, like, like Peter. Lord save me. Have you received his pardon? Do you know this radical cleansing? Are you rejoicing tonight in the knowledge of sins forgiven? And in the fullness of God's grace? Here's the greatest. And the best offer available. At any time of the year, but especially at this month of January. God's amazing offer to sinners. What will you do with this invitational ultimatum tonight? If you're out of Christ. May the Lord.